All right, well, good evening, and uh, welcome to this special Constitution Day event here at Bethel University. So for those of you who uh, don't know me, my name is Matthew Kukum. I'm Assistant Professor of Political Science here at Bethel. It's good to see all of you. I'm so pleased we have a good crowd tonight. Just want to say a few words by uh, way of introduction as we get started. So the Constitution of the United States was created in the aftermath of the American War for Independence. Now, during that war, the 13 new American states had to figure out what sort of government they wanted. Their initial attempt to create a confederation of 13 states largely failed. And this became clear within a few years of the conclusion of the war. Eventually, most of the states sent delegates to Philadelphia to consider possible solutions. They began deliberation on May 24, 1787. They very quickly decided to abandon the Articles of Confederation and create a new federal constitution. They met in secret, and quite remarkably, they completed their work in just a few months. After much debate, the constitution was ratified on June 21, 1788, when New Hampshire became the ninth state to ratify the constitution. The constitution formally went into effect on March 4, 1789. The United States was the first modern country to create a fully written constitution, and the United States Constitution is currently the oldest written constitution that is in continual use. Constitution Day, which is also known as Citizenship Day, is a federal holiday that celebrates the date on which the Constitution was signed by the delegates in Philadelphia on September 17, 1787. Now, Constitution Day is actually a relatively recent innovation. So in 2004, Senator Robert Byrd of West Virginia introduced an amendment to that year's omnibus spending bill in Congress. Now that amendment, which indeed did become law, required that all publicly funded educational institutions, that includes all those that receive federal student loans, um, that these institutions provide some sort of educational programming about the U.S. Constitution during this federal holiday. We're fudging it a bit because Constitution Day falls on a Saturday this year. Now, uh, this law has absolutely no enforcement mechanism whatsoever. Um, nonetheless, uh, Bethel's political science program has been proud to have held a Constitution Day event ever since the law's enactment. Um, but this is the first time, to my knowledge, and maybe someone in the crowd can correct me, this is the first time, to my knowledge, that we've invited an outside speaker to come give a public lecture um, on the Constitution for Constitution Day. So I'm, I'm rather excited. Um, I'm especially grateful to the Jack Miller Center for providing a grant that makes all of this possible. So the Jack Miller Center is a nonpartisan, nonprofit organization dedicated to teaching, supporting teaching and scholarship about America's founding principles and history and to cultivating thoughtful and engaged citizenship. You can find more information and I believe a web address in the little pocket Constitution that you have probably sitting in your lap. Um, I would also like to express uh, gratitude to my colleagues in the Department of History, Philosophy, and Political Science and to the Bethel Events team for supporting this event. Uh, I'd especially like to thank uh, Chris Geertz, Pam Buchanan, and Susie Nelson for their invaluable assistance, and especially to uh, Dr. Mulberry, who is recording this event for posterity. This video will be um, available in a couple of days on uh, Bethel's website and also the department's blog. I'd also like to thank the leaders of the Bethel Pre-Law Society for their assistance. Um, if you are a student here at Bethel and you're interested in a career in law, you're thinking about law school, um, come sign up, talk to, talk to Alex. Alex, wave your hand. Um, Alex will be happy to get your email address so that we can include you on the email list um, if you'd like to uh, join the club um, and receive information about upcoming events. Finally, I'm grateful to Professor Paulson for agreeing to speak with us this evening. So after the lecture, um, we'll have a time of Q&A. Um, and for those of you who are thinking about a career in law, Professor Paulson said he would be more than happy uh, to answer questions about law school or careers in law. So this is, this is a golden opportunity. Um, of course, after the Q&A, um, we can partake of the refreshments um, out in the hall. Uh, so a few words about our speaker. Uh, professor Michael Stokes Paulson is Distinguished University Chair and Professor at the University of St. Thomas School of Law. He received an M.A. in re Religion from Yale Divinity School and a J.D. from the Yale Law School, where he was an editor of the Yale Law Journal and recipient of the Harlan Fisk Stone Prize for Appellate Advocacy. After graduating from law school, he joined the Department of Justice in the Criminal Division Honors Program, 
He has also served as staff counsel for the Center for Law and Religious Freedom in Washington, D.C., and as an attorney advisor in the Office of Legal Counsel. Prior to coming to St. Thomas, Paulson served as the McKnight Presidential Professor of Law and Public Policy at the University of Minnesota Law School. Professor Paulson is among the nation's leading scholars of constitutional interpretation. He has published many articles in a number of journals, I'm not going to list them all for you, um, and also spoken at a number of different Federalist Society events. Professor Paulson is also no stranger to Bethel. He's actually, um, at one point, back in 2015, uh, taught uh, constitutional law here at Bethel University. Um, Recently, he published a book um, with his son called The Constitution, an introduction. Um, it's a great sort of primer on the Constitution, its interpretation, and its theory. Please join me in giving a warm welcome to Professor Paulson. Thank you, Matthew, for that perjurious introduction. <laughs> it was very flattering. Deans put all these credentials on the website, and they exaggerate things ever so tiny a bit, a little bit. So it's it's a little bit embarrassing. I am indeed honored to be here. I have long been a friend of the Bethel family. Um, one of my best friends in all life is uh, Dan Ritchie, who some of you may know. He just retired, and he's gallivanting around Europe or the Middle East right now, so he couldn't be here today. But uh, I've known him for like 30 years. We've been in a couple's Bible study together for 25 or 26 years. We ran the marathon together. Well, I kind of walked the marathon, and that was 18 years and two or three knee surgeries ago. I have other friends here at Bethel. My kids went to Minnehaha Academy and had their graduation ceremony at Bethel, and I know the halls of Bethel because, as Matthew uh, explained, I taught here spring semester of 2015. It was a last-minute replacement. Right. It was a Wednesday night course from 6 to 9, and whoever was set to be the instructor canceled at the last minute, and they were casting about desperately who could talk about American constitutional history. And I said, well, that sounds fun. And it was a great time. Now, nothing against law students. In fact, I have two of my law students who are skulking around here. But I won't embarrass Ms. Nelson and Mr. Smith by identifying them by name or pointing out to them. (laughs) But teaching undergrads is so cool because you are so much more open-minded and you can think outside the box and think creatively. I actually had uh, my teaching experience here was one of the best teaching experiences I've ever had. Some of the most brilliant students I've ever had. I have a number of Bethel alums who are my law students too who are here today for who are in my civil procedure class so i i love bethel university i i also love the constitution right uh and i I can't believe that they pay me to teach law school where i can just argue about constitutional law issues and i'm delighted to be here for constitution day even though i actually think that constitution day is unconstitutional. But that's an argument for another time. Invite me back next year and I'll explain that. My my title tonight, my topic tonight is Three Myths About Constitutional Interpretation. In the next 40 minutes or so, hold me to that. Don't let me go drone on. I'm going to explain and try to gently explode Uh, three really common myths about constitutional interpretation. And I I have a little handout outline that sort of bullet points what they are. The first myth is that the Constitution does not say anything about how it is to be interpreted. It specifies no rules or principles governing its own interpretation and application. And so as a consequence, everything is pretty much all up for grabs, right? It's all a matter of interpretation. It's all subjective. That's the first myth. I will argue, in contrast to that myth, that the Constitution actually says a great deal that's relevant to how it's interpreted. And it actually does implicitly and fairly explicitly prescribe rules of constitutional interpretation. It says that you should interpret the text of the Constitution according to the original objective and public meaning of the words of the text. 
and that it actually does answer the question that people say, it, you know, that it, it doesn't address at all. So that's myth number one. Myth number two is that constitutional interpretation is solely a matter for the courts and ultimately for the Supreme Court as Supreme Interpreter. I will argue, in contrast, that the Constitution designates no single authoritative interpreter. It doesn't specify a supreme interpreter, but rather, as a consequence of the separation of powers and the division of authority, constitutional interpretation is a game played by everyone who exercises governmental power and that they exercise checks and balances on each other. It's not all up to the Supreme Court. And then the third myth that I'll talk about is sort of builds on the at first two, okay? And that is that judicial constitutional interpretation is all a matter of politics. It's all a matter of what the judges political views are. And if you get conservative Republican appointed judge justices, they will write their policy views into the Constitution. And if you get liberal activist Democratic justices and judges, they will write their own views into the Constitution. If you think that constitutional interpretation is all subjective, and if you think that the Supreme Court says what the Constitution means, combine that pure subjectivity and the power you actually do yield for people who hold that philosophy, uh, the idea that it is a projection of the justice's own values, but that won't be true if you hold a philosophy of uh, adhering to the Constitution in terms of its original meaning. So that's what I'll talk about. I'll spend about 10, 12 minutes on each proposition. But first, I want to warm you up with a hypothetical. Actually, it's an exam question. It's one of the exam questions I put on my 2015 American Constitutional History exam. I printed it out. I have it here. I'm not making this up. Question number one was a version of this hypothetical. Imagine Congress passes the Sedition Act of, I'll update it, and we'll make it 2025. Okay, the Sedition Act that makes it a crime to criticize the government of the United States probably unconstitutional. This crime is defined as high treason, and the crime is punishable by death by slow torture immediately tomorrow afternoon. The president has no power to pardon any offenders, and he's required to prosecute everybody. There are no rights to jury trial or judicial review. And, oh, the statute, the Sedition Act, identifies certain perpetrators of this tr crime of high treason by name. They identify Professor Michael Paulson is hereby deemed guilty of treason against the Constitution for things he said last year. It's getting pretty unconstitutional, right? And, and then the conviction and uh, execution shall take place that afternoon and shall work a corruption of blood and a forfeiture of assets for the next six direct gen generations of lineal descendants. Okay. That's my hypothetical. I, I actually gave it on the exam question. <laughs> my first question is, is this unconstitutional? <laughs> well, that was sort of the give, give, me, give me, right? Yeah, it, you know, it violates the First Amendment, it abrogates the president's constitutional power to grant pardons, it requires prosecution impairing executive discretion, it works corruption of blood, it's a bill of attainder, it's an ex post facto law, and it violates the Eighth Amendment prohibition of cruel and unusual punishment. This is about as unconstitutional as... Are you with me? This is objectively, incontrovertibly, undeniably, outrageously unconstitutional. Do you all agree? Okay, if so, I've got you for the rest of what I've said. Okay? The next question, the first real question is, and identify, I identified a student who actually had the last name Goodman, President Goodman. Uh, you might remember her from about five, six, seven years ago, some of you. <clears throat> is President Goodman obliged to execute this statute? And and execute Mr. Paulson. Okay, that's question number one. Does the president have any power and duty of constitutional interpretation? Okay. 
second question, imagine that notwithstanding the act saying you can't do this, Professor Paulson somehow brings a case, gets it all the way up to the U.S. Supreme Court. He's arguing that this is unconstitutional, and the Supreme Court upholds the constitutionality of the statute. It was objectively, incontrovertibly, undeniably unconstitutional, but the Supreme Court got it badly wrong. Is the statute constitutional now because the Supreme Court said it was constitutional, or is it still objectively, incontrovertibly, undeniably unconstitutional? So that's my second question. You know, does the Supreme Court's interpretation change it? And does the president have to execute me now? Or does the president still have an independent power of interpretation? Then the last question, you know, professors always ask multi-part questions, right? Imagine a subsequent case. We'll call it United States versus Matthew Kukan, (laughs) who is similarly identified by the statute as one of these malefactors who is guilty of high treason, okay? A second case comes up, and there's the controlling, squarely on point precedent of United States versus Paulson. Should the second court do in United States versus Kukum what they did in United States versus Paulson solely because of the consequence of the precedent decision? Okay, now think about that. Have. Please have these questions in the back of your mind as I go and explore these three myths, okay? Myth number one is that the Constitution does not say anything about how it is to be interpreted, doesn't even suggest any principles governing its interpretation. A variation on this myth is that everything is vague and open-ended, and basically you can pour into the constitutional words whatever meaning you want, as a consequence, constitutional interpretation is all pretty much subjective. Everything is up for grabs. So the myth goes. But is that really true? What does the Constitution say about how it is to be interpreted and applied? And actually, I think it says quite a bit. And I'm glad you have pocket constitutions with you because you can do a little scavenger hunt and play along at home. Um, first, the Constitution designates a specific, single, authoritative, written text as supreme law. The preamble to the Constitution says, we the people hereby ordain and establish this Constitution. By this Constitution, they mean this Constitution. This is a pocket Constitution, well-worn, and the cover is coming off. Article 6 of the Constitution contains the Supremacy Clause, sometimes referred to as the Supreme Law Clause. And it says, this Constitution and the laws of the United States made in pursuance of the treaties of the United States shall be the supreme law of the land and the judges in every state shall be bound thereby. Now, this is not nothing about how to interpret the Constitution. This is hugely significant. The Constitution says, in express terms, that it is the written text of the Constitution that has been adopted by the people and that is authoritative and binding as supreme law. The Constitution says when you're doing constitutional interpretation, you are reading a written text and trying to figure out what it means. The text specifies the text as the object of constitutional interpretation. So it doesn't say nothing about constitutional law. Secondly, By virtue of how specific the text is in designating this Constitution as the supreme law, it clearly implies, very strongly implies, that the written text is exclusive, right? Anything that's not in the written text is not part of this Constitution. If it isn't in here, it isn't in here. We do not have, in whole or in part, an unwritten Constitution. So the Constitution specifies a single, specific, authoritative written text, and it implicitly says that nothing else is part of the Constitution. Third, stay in the supremacy clause of Article 6 and look at the very next clause. I refer to this as the oath clause. It comes right after the supremacy clause, 
And it says that all who exercise authority under this Constitution are bound by oath or affirmation to support this Constitution. They are bound to abide by the supremacy and the binding nature of the Constitution's text as supreme law. I think that's pretty significant, too. And then fourth and finally, there's Article 5, which is immediate preceding article of the Constitution, which specifies the constitutional amendment process. It has this elaborate procedure whereby you can adopt amendments to the Constitution. Two-thirds majorities of both houses of Congress can propose it, and then it takes three-fourths of the states to ratify either special state ratifying conventions or state legislatures, whichever mode Congress shall direct. You can also have constitutional conventions. It's really hard. It's really specific. It's really detailed. But think about what that implies for constitutional interpretation. It says that the const- you, in order to change the content of the Constitution, in order to change the meaning of the Constitution, you've got to change the words of the Constitution. When you adopt an elaborate new text, that becomes part of this Constitution, and that's the only way that you can change the Constitution. You can't amend the Constitution by interpreting it to mean something that it doesn't say. Otherwise, it'd be an end run around the amendment process. So the conclusion of all this, to me, seems pretty much inescapable, that the Constitution's text prescribes fidelity to a single, specific, exclusive, defined, determinate, written, legal text designed to serve as permanent supreme law, the content of which can be changed only by a formal process of changing the text itself. The Constitution does say how it is to be interpreted. Now, it doesn't go into a whole lot more detail than that, in part because this is probably what everybody generally understood. If you have a written Constitution, you're interpreting the words of the written Constitution. It doesn't say that judges and other government officials can't change the meanings of the word. It doesn't quite say that. But think of how that's necessarily logically implied. If everybody could change the meanings of the Constitution and just adopt their own interpretations, then the Constitution's text is no longer supreme law of the land. The interpreter is, right? If we have an interpretive picnic and you bring the words, but I get to supply all the meanings, I win. My meanings will eat your words every time, right? So it has to be the objective meaning of the words, not a subjective standard. It can't be that you can just ascribe your own meanings to the words of the Constitution. It also seems to me that it follows that it must be the original meaning of the words. Now, the Constitution doesn't quite specify that, too, but again, I think it's necessarily implicit. The Constitution is a written document, written at a particular time, addressed to a particular political community, reflecting certain assumptions designed to function as supreme law. It is a historical document written at a particular point in time. To read the words of the Constitution divorced from their historical context is to engage in a huge linguistic anachronism. You're just sort of inventing things and taking them out of their proper place and time. Therefore, I conclude that the task of faithful Constitution is simply this. You ready for it? Okay. I actually wrote it down on a McDonald's napkin a few years ago. I was giving a talk at one university in Oklahoma, and it was late to go to the other university, and I had to stop, and I didn't have anything to eat. And so I was truly desperate, so I stopped at a McDonald's. And I said, okay, what is my focus? What is my main point? And I, uh, and I still have that McDonald's napkin from 2016. And I wrote this. The object of constitutional interpretation is accurately to ascertain and then faithfully apply the objective, original meaning of the words and phrases of the Constitution. That is, the meaning that the words and terms would have to a reasonably informed speaker and reader of the English language, taking into account their linguistic context and the political context, being attentive to things like the structure of the document, taking into account any specific historical term of art usages, but basically the task of constitutional interpretation is to figure out the meaning of the words and to apply them faithfully. 
If what you are doing is constitutional interpretation, that is your task. It is not an all up for grant subjective test. Um, it takes lawyers and judges to make constitutional interpretation something considerably more obscure and mysterious than that. It really is pretty straightforward. Now, there are three obvious, fairly obvious questions or objections that you can raise or that you might raise. You might actually think of some more of them, but here are the three that I, that I want to talk about for a brief period. The first one is what I call the dead hand of the past question. The second one is, what about vague or open-ended provisions? And the third is, what about precedent? Okay, The dead hand of the past. First, let me talk about the dead hand. This is the question like, why on earth should we be governed by a document written 235 years ago by a bunch of now long-dead white male property owners? That's actually a good question. And the Constitution doesn't answer it. The Constitution doesn't say why you should adopt the Constitution. That's a political science class question. I defer to Professor Kukim on that. It, I think it's imaginable that you could say having a written Constitution is not necessarily the best way to run a government. It's not necessarily a good system. But, it would, but the objection that this is a long, dead uh, document that has been written by people long ago, why on earth should we govern by it, is really an objection to written constitutionalism or to constitutionalism in general. Um, the second point about the dead hand of the past, basically, if what you are doing is interpreting and applying a written constitution, you are giving effect to the dead hand of the past. The whole idea of constitutionalism is that certain decisions made at time X become binding and constrained actors at time Y. And if you are a government official who signed on to the Constitution, a judge, a president, a member of Congress, you swore an oath to support this Constitution. Supposedly, you've already made the decision to be governed by the dead hand of the past. I don't think it's uh, necessary that you conclude that this is the best constitution in the world. But if what you are doing is interpreting the constitution, you are interpreting a dead document and giving it that applicability as a current law. Okay. Second objection or question is, what about provisions of the constitution that are vague or ambiguous? What is the meaning of the Constitution when it's unclear? And, and my answer is that this is actually an embarrassingly easy response. Where the Constitution does not answer a question, the Constitution does not answer a question. Where the Constitution does not supply an answer, the Constitution does not supply an answer. And we, the people, get to choose the policies we want through the institutions of representative government. Now, no theory of constitutional interpretation answers every question with perfect precision. Right? I think original meaning, reading of the text, does a fairly uh, fair bit better job than most other interpretations. But there's often room for reasonable debate about what is the proper understanding of the meaning of the words. Right? So no honest interpretation, uh, uh, honest method answers every question. But at least interpreting it according to the original meaning provides a good sort of, as it were, default rule when meaning runs out, right? When you can't answer a question, the Constitution says, we leave it to we the people. So I think there's an answer to that question, too. Third question is, what about precedent? What about stare decisis? One of my favorite cartoons is there's this little boy standing next to the broken cookie jar, and his mom has his hand, her hands on his hips, and she's looking at him. And he says, what about precedent? What about stare decisis? As if that will get him out from under. Okay. I think if the task of constitutional interpretation is to faithfully understand and apply the words of the document itself, precedent can have a, only a limited role. It can serve as an information function. It can inform the interpreter, guide, persuade, might provide a baseline for thinking about it. You get the benefit of somebody else's prior thinking. But precedent 
can't change the meaning of the Constitution. United States versus Paulson does not change the meaning of the Constitution. If the Sedition Act is unconstitutional, it is still unconstitutional. Think about it. If a wrong judicial decision could alter the meaning of the Constitution, that would undermine and contradict the supremacy of the document as supreme law. It would also permit de facto amendment of the Constitution by judicial interpretation and misinterpretation. So I'm going to propose to you a radical proposition, and I think this will be memorable to you. Stare decisis, have you heard that term before, the idea of adhering to precedent? If it's understood as meaning that you should adhere to a precedent even where you would otherwise conclude it is just flat out wrong, stare decisis is unconstitutional. It contradicts the Constitution. So the punchline is that precedent can advise the interpreter but cannot revise the Constitution. So that's myth number one. The Constitution says nothing about how constitutional interpretation. It sure does. Myth number two. Constitutional interpretation is a matter solely for the courts and the Supreme Court's interpretations of the Constitution are supreme over everybody else. You've all heard some version or another of this myth. It goes something, you know, you heard it in kindergarten, in grade school, in eighth grade civics class. You may have heard it in your AP U.S. government class. I sure hope you didn't hear it in Intro to American Political Institutions. But the, the myth goes something like this. A long, long time ago, in a galaxy far, far away, <laughs> in the case of Marbury versus Madison in 1803, the Supreme Court invented the doctrine of judicial review. Under this myth, the, the Supreme Court can then strike down acts of the other branches of the government as unconstitutional, and the Supreme Court's interpretations are, well, they're supreme. It is the supreme power of the judiciary over the other branches of government because the Supreme Court has the supreme power of constitutional interpretation. It's the bind everybody. It's the superpower, and it's the crowning feature of our separation of powers for the courts to serve as the ultimate constitutional check in their decisions behind everybody else. Nearly every feature of this myth is wrong. The Supreme Court did not invent the doctrine of judicial review in Marbury versus Madison. The idea of judicial review had been around for a dozen or 20 years well before Marbury versus Madison and was well accepted by the time Marbury rolls around in 1803. Moreover, the understanding of the idea of judicial review was never a power of judicial supremacy over everybody else. It was a notion of the Constitution's supremacy, so that if another branch violated the Constitution, the judiciary in a proper case could say, that's not the law, the Constitution is law. Marbury versus Madison never claims judicial supremacy. You can write that down. Marbury versus Madison never claims judicial supremacy. Uh, the model that I think is correct is this, is that the power of constitutional interpretation, far from being assigned to any one branch exclusively, is a shared, divided power split among everybody who exercises government authority and swears an oath to support the Constitution. It's a shared, divided power. Think of it as not being a pope, the Supreme Court, but more of a Protestant view of the priesthood of all believers. All who exercise authority under the Constitution have an equal privilege and entitlement to interpret the Constitution and apply it faithfully. And I think you can follow this by just thinking about what the Constitution's text says, what the Constitution's structure says, what evidence of the original intention of the framers was, and even Marbury versus Madison. So let me just run them as quickly bullet point-ish as I can. The, nothing in the text of the Constitution supports the idea of judicial supremacy over everybody else in constitutional interpretation. It's just not there. 
There is no supreme interpreter clause. You can look through the, the pocket constitution. You will never see a clause that says the Supreme Court is the supreme interpreter of the constitution. It just ain't there. And in the supremacy clause, it says this constitution is a supreme law of the land. It says nothing about judicial decisions being part of the supreme law of the land. Instead, it says that everybody swears an oath to support this constitution. That gives all the branches of government an independent prerogative to interpret the constitution. Now, the Supreme Court gets the power to exercise the judicial power. They get to decide cases under the constitution. But that makes the Supreme Court the supreme court within the judiciary. It's not the supreme branch over everybody else. The constitution never says anything of the sort. So that's the text of the constitution. The structure of the Constitution is equally important. Part of the text is the fact that it is divided into separate independent branches of government. In fact, the most singular structural feature of the Constitution, something at the very core of its design, is the separation and independence and coordinacy of the branches. None is bound by the views of any of the others. If we know anything about the framers' political theory and views, it was that they feared concentrations of power and that they divided power and provided checks and balances from competing institutions because the worst thing would be for one branch to acquire all the power. Think of how contrary judicial supremacy is to that. If you have the power to interpret all the other powers, you are the superpower and all the power becomes concentrated in you. Nothing is more inconsistent with the framers' separation of powers design than the claim that any one branch is supreme over the others. So there's text, there's the structures, log the structural logic of the Constitution. There's also evidence from original intention and history. No one at the time who supported the Constitution ever said that the courts were to be the Supreme Branch. They never, opponents of the Constitution sometimes said that. They said, this is a dangerous Constitution. The judges will have all the power and they will be renegades and there's nothing to control them. Alexander Hamilton's Federalist Papers on the Judiciary are a point-by-point -point emphatic rejection of that proposition. They deny any claim that the Judiciary is supreme over everybody else. In fact, James Madison in the Federalist Number 49 wrote this. The several departments, that's branches, being perfectly coordinate by the terms of their common commission, neither of them, it is evident, can pretend to an exclusive or superior right of settling the boundaries between their respective powers. No prominent framer, ratifier, no obscure pro, uh, framers, ratifier, or defender of the Constitution ever embraced the proposition of judicial supremacy. And there's precedent. Now, in modern precedent, the Supreme Court has indeed declared itself the supreme branch. But think about how begging of the question that is. We are the boss because we say we are the boss. This is flatly incompatible with the reasoning of Marbury versus Madison. Now, if you've studied Marbury versus Madison in eighth grade or civics class or in U.S. history or in Bethel University poli sci classes, Marbury versus Madison says basically this. If the Constitution says one thing and a statute says something else, the courts should go with the Constitution and not the faithless departure from it by the legislative branch. That's basically the logic, is the Constitution's supremacy over departures from it. Now think about that for a second. The same logic, the exact same logic applies to judicial decisions. Imagine a judicial decision contrary to the Constitution. If the Constitution says one thing and a judicial decision says something else entirely, which one is the supreme law? The logic of Marbury versus Madison is the Constitution trumps the faithless departure from it by anybody else. So that if you're the president of the United States and you're called upon to execute an unconstitutional law, you have a duty to put the Constitution above the unconstitutional law. If you're the president 
and you are called upon to enforce and execute an unconstitutional lawless judicial decision, you have to put the Constitution ahead of the faithless judicial decision. So that brings me back to the Bethel final exam question. Does the president have to execute me? No! If the Supreme Court says he has to, ex he has to execute me, does he have to execute me? No, because the duty is to the Constitution, not to the faithless departure from it. Now, now I know what some of you are thinking. If this is true, it's anarchy, madness, chaos. You can have competing different interpretations of the Constitution. Yes. I don't think that's chaos. I think that's a decentralized model of constitutional interpretation. I think of it as checks and balances by the various branches. I also have Abraham Lincoln on my side, but I'll save that for the question and answer in case you get to it. You know, someone in my one of my uh, advanced courses said, invoke Abraham Lincoln, because that's almost like stacking the deck. Everybody wants to be on the Lincoln team, but Lincoln was a decided opponent of judicial supremacy, and nearly everything he did in his presidential career was an attack or an affront to judicial supremacy. If you believe in judicial supremacy, you have to believe that Lincoln was an unconstitutional president. So that's myth number two, that only the Supreme Court interprets the Constitution. Okay, myth number three. I'll, say, I'll spend a little less time on this. Myth number three is that constitutional interpretation is, as a consequence of these other myths, really just a matter of judicial politics. It's all a matter of the judges writing into the Constitution their personal policy preferences. And you've probably heard versions of this uh, in the media that criticize the Supreme Court. Oh, the Trump judges are just rewriting the Constitution in accordance with their own political views. And you probably heard versions of this when the, the uh, Democrats were in ascendancy. The liberals, activists, are just writing their views into the law of the Supreme Court. Now, this cynical-sounding myth is actually partially true. So I'm only going to give a semi-explosion, a half-explosion. The myth that constitutional interpretation is a matter of political preferences holds true for judges who swallow myth number one and number two. Right? If you hold a judicial philosophy that assumes that the Constitution doesn't say anything about how it's to be interpreted and it's all up for grabs, and you're the one that gets to grab it, you can grab it and run with it however you want. So if you hold that judicial philosophy, then for you, constitutional interpretation really might be a matter of projecting onto the Constitution your personal policy preferences. And unfortunately, there are some that fairly describe some judges, since the characterization is activist or progressive or living constitutionalism. It's basically a misnomer for judges who hold the belief that we really can pour our desired meaning into the Constitution. But that's an unfair, misguided criticism for justices who hold an interpretive philosophy of being governed by the original objective meaning of the words of the text as understood in the context by English language speakers at the time. Because for such judges, the meaning of the Constitution is at least ostensibly something wholly apart from their political or policy preferences. At least it should be if they're interpreting the Constitution faithfully to the premises that they say they are. In fact, that's part of the point. The point of adhering to the meaning of the text of the Constitution is that the judges do not get to make the Constitution into whatever they want it to be. So judicial philosophy matters, obviously, and a judge's judicial philosophy will have political consequences, certainly. But an activist judicial philosophy, one that swallows myths one and number two, is directly political in a way that an, an originalist judicial philosophy is not. So those are the three myths. One, first, that the Constitution doesn't say anything about how it's to be interpreted. Sure, it does. Secondly, that it's all up to the Supreme Court, and whatever the Supreme Court says goes, no, no, the power to interpret is divided and shared among numerous actors. And third, that it's all a matter of judicial politics, and it only is if you subscribe to those first two myths. So how about that final exam question? Okay. 
So I'm going to offer a short model answer to conclude. My hypothetical Sedition Act is unconstitutional. Objectively, incontrovertibly, there are some, at least some, objective right answers to constitutional questions. It's not all subjective. The Constitution does supply an interpretive methodology, and you can fairly read the text of the Constitution and say that this act is unconstitutional. Question number two, does the president have to enforce it? No. The constitutional power of constitutional interpretation is divided among multiple actors, and the president swears an oath to preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution. The president has the power not to execute me. Isn't that a relief? Third, what if the Supreme Court makes a wrong decision, a flagrantly wrong constitution? The answer that I was looking for, if the students mastered the discussion in the class, was that the Supreme Court saying something is so doesn't make it so if it's wrong. The Sedition Act is still unconstitutional. It doesn't become magically constitutional because the Supreme Court renders a wrong decision. United States versus Paulson is wrong, and the president should still not execute Mr. Paulson. This is very much relieving to me. I was very disturbed by the students who said, oh, no, if the Supreme Court says it, <laughs> off with your head this afternoon. And then finally, a wrong precedent is just a wrong precedent. The court should never follow a precedent decision where it is fully persuaded on correct interpretive criteria that the decision is wrong. You should not execute Professor Kukem just because you wrongly executed Professor Paulson. Stare decisis is unconstitutional. So those are the three myths. I'd love to talk to you more about them. And so I'm just open for your questions. Uh, all right. Um, so if you have a question, uh, why don't you uh, come on up and you can form a queue um, over on this side. Uh, anything about... Or if, or if people are landlocked. Uh, the, oh. the microphone can't travel. So oh, okay. um, we are recording this. Um, and so it's really great um, if we could actually get people's audio um, so that this okay. can make it into the recording as well. So, um, so if you want to ask a question, come on up, uh, form a queue. Um, so come on up. Don't be shy. I know there's some great questions uh, floating out there. Um, if you want to start us out, that'd be fantastic. And when you come, if you could just introduce yourself um, and then ask um, a relatively short question, please. Thank you. you. And I'll give a relatively long answer. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm, I'm a foreigner. I just came a member of the general public, but I know Professor Paulson, so I wanted to hear what he'd say. I have a pretty good idea what he's going to say because I've read some of his stuff. But uh, particularly relating to your question number three, that one is, I suppose, particularly relevant these days uh, re relating to the Dobbs case where there was uh, people that were claiming that, for example, Roe v. Wade is some sort of super precedent. So maybe you want to uh, expand on a little bit in, in the context of that. Uh, okay, sure. Not to be controversial or anything. <clears throat> um, I, I've written many places many times that I think Roe versus Wade is a wrongly decided, constitutionally indefensible decision of the U.S. Supreme Court. Nothing in the text of the Constitution, nothing in the structure of the Constitution, nothing in evidence of the original intention of anybody who adopted the, the amendments uh, remotely supports creation of a constitutional right of some human beings to terminate the lives of other human beings. It's long been, it's, it is sort of the example par excellence of judicial activism where the courts sort of invent provisions of the Constitution that reflect their policy preferences. So I was greatly cheered when the Supreme Court, after 49 years, overrules Roe versus Wade. The, the, the Dobbs case goes by the name Dobbs versus Jackson Women's Health Organization. And the Supreme Court, by a vote of six to three, overruled Dobbs. And you can understand the predictable criticism is, what about precedent? What about stare decisis? Is it somehow judicial activism for the Supreme Court to overturn its precedents? 
I think it isn't. I think it's judicial restoration of the Constitution. If Roe versus Wade was always wrong, it doesn't become right just because it was decided before. So I really think that the criticism that some in the media and some uh, pro-choice activists have leveled against the court as for def- departing from stare decisis is really misguided. Now, if you think Roe versus Wade is right, then you adhere to it not because it's a precedent, but because you think it's right. It's a correct interpretation. Stare decisis, the weight of precedent, really adds nothing because you don't need a theory of adhering to precedent to justify you in going along with what you think was right on other grounds, right? It's not that Roe versus Wade was... <clears throat> it's not merely the fact that Roe versus Wade is decided. If you think Roe versus Wade is right, you're adhering to it because it's right. But if you think that it's wrongly decided, there should be no precedential force that would bind a court to adhere to its wrong precedents. So is that on tape? I'll have some enemies. <laughs> <clears throat> I've said stuff like that before. Was that responsive? I, I think so. Okay. And, and since there's nobody else in the line, can I ask you a question not directly related to your, your lecture today? <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, this is a First Amendment question. So in once the, the First Amendment is all What relevant. if I'm not prepared? Oh, oh, go ahead. <laughs> well, that's the idea. Uh, uh, the First Amendment, of course, operates only against government, state action. Now, there's been some indication that uh, the Biden administration has been, I won't say colluding, but at least collaborating with the big tech companies to, uh, I'll I'll use perhaps a loaded word, suppress what they call disinformation. Uh, does, Does that, uh, again, we'll, we'll say collaboration. Does that amount to, let's say, a quasi-violation of the First Amendment uh, that's enforceable uh, against the government? Or uh, we just have to adhere I'm, directly I'm to I'm going to duck the question by saying I don't really know all the facts. But I can, I can explain a few legal principles of the First Amendment. The Constitution limits government. Okay, It is a constraint on what the government can do. There's actually only one provision of the Constitution that directly limits what private individuals can do, and that's the 13th Amendment. You can't own slaves, right? The 13th Amendment prohibits slavery, but otherwise the Constitution limits the powers of government and provides rights against the government. So if a tech company, let's make it a private tech company. So let me me break down your question and just sort of think out loud. If Google or Facebook says, we don't want this speech on our platform, my view is that's exercising their First Amendment right. If Bethel University says, we don't wish to have a certain type of group or speaker on our campus, that's not an impairment of the speaker's First Amendment rights. That's an exercise of Bethel University's First Amendment rights as a private institution. You with me? You can follow up. <clears throat> okay. <clears throat> uh, Mr. Upcraft's question is, what if the government is involved in the private organization's decision? I can imagine a circumstance where government policy or regulation requires private companies to censor, and then there'd be a constitutional problem because of the government action. But if it's a purely private institution, I think they have their First Amendment rights to decide who they wish to speak. Come on, walk up to the... Let's get some more questions. I I will throw out a question, but I I really want to get some people in this this queue. So, um, ah. I just want to sit down for like two hours and chat about your, um, just get more thoughts on, on what you spoke to us about. So I want to sort of follow up a little bit. Um, you, you offered a few qualifications on sort of the work that originalism can do for us, um, looking to the original sort of objective 
meaning of the text. And I wonder if you could sort of speak to um, sort of what we've seen, and I'm speaking purely as an amateur, right? Um, what we've seen is we've seen sort of an increased um, trajectory towards the Supreme Court um, using a more sort of originalist and perhaps a textualist sort of approach to jurisprudence. Um, looking, and this is true also amongst judges who would have a more sort of liberal or progressive politics, right? Even, you know, if you read Justice Elena Kagan, right? So she seems to um, be buying into some of the sort of the originalist or the textualist sort of approach to thinking about the Constitution. Um, but it, it seems that um, as, as we've seen sort of this trend, um, what we've seen is we've seen cases in which sort of originalism or perhaps textualism is used by judges sort of on both sides um, to try to um, sort of present their preferred outcomes as the only true sort of constitutional sort of right outcome. Um, and and sometimes it seems like there's um, a very sort of, well, let me give an example. So and if we're going to take another sort of recent Supreme Court case. So the recent Supreme Court case um, that struck, struck down um, a gun law in New York. And Justice Thomas uh, wrote a very long concurring opinion um, and in this concurring opinion, um, if I'm remembering this correctly, I thought uh, he wrote the majority. No, it was the majority. Opinion. It was a majority opinion. Oh, okay. He wrote the concurring opinion in I read I think, it the case. And in the majority opinion, he spent a very large time in that opinion basically walking through how um, <clears throat> the Second Amendment should be interpreted in a certain way. And he used, um, I mean, he, he burnt several dozen pages diving into sort of the, the text, um, the text, history, and tr tradition of sort of. Second Amendment interpretation and um, and laws related to to gun regulation, um, and one of the criticisms of Justice Thomas um, in his majority opinion was that um, that in fact he selectively chose um, certain laws and wrote history in such a way that sort of omitted omitted other sorts of laws that would be inconvenient for his case and upholding and striking down this particular this particular gun law in the state of New York. And some people said, we're saying essentially that originalism doesn't always supply um, all the tools that you might want um, when trying to decide on some of these, these difficult cases, um, especially when um, the part of the Constitution in question is rather vague. The Second Amendment um, has been has been hotly debated for quite some time. That's a very long, convoluted question. I guess why I want, I want to push you a little bit to sort of comment on sort of the limits of originalism and how sometimes, um, and, and to maybe speak to the critics who say that originalism is, sim is simply being weaponized by some justices to try to get their preferred outcome, right? Um, okay. It's simply a way for them to achieve sort of their politics, right? Um, as you say in myth three, so... I'm going to throw all that at you. It's totally unfair, okay, but I'd love me, to hear your response. Let me untangle it and start. The idea that you should adhere to the original objective meaning of the text is a methodology. right? It doesn't necessarily answer every question, and there might be differences, legitimate differences of the conclusion as to how to weigh the evidence of what the original meaning was. And I think, you know, I read the gun case once quickly at the cabin before going back out in the kayak and swimming this summer. <clears throat> and I thought it was interesting, but I'm not deep into the, the weeds of the particulars of it. But I think that if you have originalism as a method, you're kind of accountable to that method. Right? <clears throat> and people can make arguments that you are not faithful to your methodology because there's a there's a constraint in what you what actually counts as a methodology. So <clears throat> I think that to criticize originalism as manipulable is probably way overstated. It doesn't answer everything, but it does constrain the interpretive enterprise, and there are criteria by which you can judge whether somebody's doing it correctly. You can argue about it. And when people say, this is just conservatives writing their values into the Constitution, if, if you have an interpretive methodology that is unconstrained by the original meaning of the text and everything like that, then that's totally manipulable. 
So the, the, the answer to that, to that objection is, if I may borrow a New York City street cab driver's phraseology, so's your mother, right? Uh, <clears throat> the objection that uh, originalism is manipulable that's nothing compared to anti-originalism or non-originalism. And the interpretive methodology gives you a way to evaluate whether somebody's doing it right. Now, I have read nominally originalist decisions that, that actually seem to me to be doing it badly. And I think that then what you say is, I think that's an unsound interpretation. Here is why you're wrong according to the premises we purport to share in common. Hi, my name is Sam Schulte. I'm a junior here. I'm in the political science department. I was wondering, what did you mean when you said Constitution Day is unconstitutional? Oh. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> Bethel University is a private organization and has First Amendment rights, and Bethel University can be as Bethel as it wants to be. As religious, has, as values, okay. So it, Bethel University gets to control the content of its own expression. That's the First Amendment. It's a First Amendment argument. It's a very slight impairment of Bethel's First Amendment rights, but to condition a neutrally available benefit to students on following that dollars into the institution and controlling what the institution may say, must say, must not say, is an arguable impairment of the institution's First Amendment rights. Now, I would never say, well, I'm, I, I can't speak for Bethel University, right? Bethel University might say, no, we hate the Constitution. We wish not to be seen as embracing the Constitution. And Constitution Day, making us put on a program celebrating the Constitution, that's like devil worship. We hate that. If those were Bethel University's religious views and First Amendment views, then the government attempt to impose a speech on Bethel would violate its First Amendment rights. So the funding condition attached to this appropriations bill that says that everybody whose students bring a government grant to them has to put on a Constitution Day program is a violation of the First Amendment. But I've never written this article because <laughs> I have other fish to fry that are a little bigger than that. And I kind of like Constitution Day. I think it's fun. Hey. So, so I'm Adam and I'm a freshman and I've heard of like on the news about like the due process clause and I've like not really sure what it means and how it relates to like the three myths. Ah, okay. Due process clause, there are actually two due process clauses. The Fifth Amendment pro prohibits government from depriving somebody of life, liberty, or property without due process of law. And then the Fourteenth Amendment extends that prohibition to the states. So government may not deprive someone of life, liberty, and property without due process of law. The due process clauses are sometimes cited as these vague and open-ended clauses. But actually, if you attend to the original meaning that the words due process of law had in historical context, they are a pretty clear determinate meaning. Due process of law meant that government must act in accordance with law. Government can't just make up its rules arbitrarily without pre-existing law and impose punishment on you or take your prop life, your liberty or property without giving you an opportunity to be heard on the question of whether you did indeed violate that enacted law. So I think the due process clauses are actually fairly determinate if you adhere to original meaning. There is this doctrine that is the basis for Roe versus Wade called substantive due process. Substantive process, that's kind of like saying green redness, right? It's or military intelligence. 
<clears throat> you know, it, it's, it's, I'm, I'm being funny there. It is a contradiction in terms to say that the due process clause substantively limits what government can do because that's not what it says. Um, still, that is, incredibly enough, the doctrine on which Roe versus Wade was decided, and it has historical antecedents in the Dred Scott decision. Dred Scott versus Sanford, which invalidated the government's restriction on the expansion of slavery, held that to deprive a slave owner of his slave property was a violation of due process of law. But if you think about it, that's not what the text says. The text doesn't say that you can't deprive someone of life, liberty, or property. It says you can't deprive them of it without due process of law. It is a purely procedural restriction. Thank you. I'm Cosette mm. Henriksen. I'm a senior in high school PSCO student here. And my question was, since like it's pretty clear that the Supreme Court is supposed to be like above partisanship and... Um, above that in order to make laws or reaffirm laws and stuff uh it's kind of like debated like if they actually are partisan and like along political lines and stuff but like should they still get that lifetime seating if they are like biased towards like different laws and how they interpret them okay. just kind of asking what your opinion is great question is great question <clears throat> um The process of selecting and confirming judges, federal judges, is a political process, right? And it's actually designed that way by the Constitution. In its way, it's sort of an upfront check on the Supreme Court and the other judges before you can have a lifetime appointment. You have to be nominated by the president, confirmed by the Senate, and they can run you through the ringer. And they can apply their independent power of constitutional interpretation to judge whether you will be faithful to the Constitution as they understand it. That means that <clears throat> there will be some... There will be consequences to the decisions of political actors that then end up reflected in the composition of the Supreme Court. So... <clears throat> While the justices are not partisan, they are selected by a partisan process. And I think that will definitely have effects. Now, people say, well, that's terrible. We shouldn't do that. We should have nonpartisan judges. They should not be appointed by the political process. The vision of the framers of the Constitution was that because the judges and justices exercise significant federal government power, they should be carefully selected through a, you know, that the president would be a good president and would make these choices and would be checked by the Senate. And that once they were in office, the justices should serve for life because otherwise they would be subject to political pressures, right? True judicial independence comes from having a lifetime job and they can't reduce your salary, right? So if the term of the Supreme Court were limited to 10 or 12 years, people would always be thinking about their next job and might be doing things that would be politically ingratiating. So I think that the true, the selection process is a political selection process. But then once someone takes their seat on a federal bench, their independence comes from their life tenure, and I, I, I'm, I'm with the framers on that. You want to come oh, back? Yeah, then if you believe that they should have that lifetime seating, shouldn't like citizens be able to vote on who is um, the justice? Because then it would kind of be a check back on the Supreme Court. Um, like Since we are kind of being affected by it, shouldn't it be like a voting thing, kind of like the presidency, rather than the president appointing the Supreme Court, which could lead to more bias. I don't know which would lead to more bias, having presidents checked by the Senate making appointments or the voters. I would hate to put the Supreme Court up to majority votes because then it really is a political consequence very directly. 
Still, the, the framers of the Constitution thought that all three branches of government should be either directly or indirectly accountable to the people. And they said for judges that the strongest argument was, that was the strongest case for being indirectly chosen. They're not elected by people, but they're selected by elected representatives. And the idea is that that sort of refines it and makes it a little less political. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. But it's it's a great question. Thank you. Hi, uh, I'm Seth Haskin. I'm a neuroscience major at Bethel. Uh, my question comes with the um, the the precedence uh, idea when it comes to the executive branch, because there are explicit powers that the president has, and then there are like implicit powers that the president has because of precedence. In what ways are the implicit powers kind of not going to go away because of that? I'm not sure. I, can I just sort of think out loud mm-hmm. about your question? Um, my view is that the Constitution prevails over the faithless precedent every time. And that's, you can get your head around that pretty easily with respect to judicial precedents, right? A judicial precedent says something and the Constitution says something else. What about executive branch precedents? And actually, what occurs to me as a good example of that and it's not judicial precedent, is presidents unconstitutionally start wars on their own. <clears throat> uh, the Constitution says that Congress has the power to declare war, and the president doesn't. Um, yet for about 50 or 70 or 80 years, presidents have been initiating wars or some, you know, the Korean War was a war. If 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 anything is a war, that was a war, and it was never declared or authorized by Congress. Presidents and their justice departments are now saying, we can bomb Libya, we can bomb Syria, we can do this military action because we've done it before. There is a whole body of executive branch precedent interpreting the president's power in a way that's unconstitutional. There are very few judicial decisions interpreting the scope of war powers. I'm teaching a seminar, just taught it this afternoon, on war, national security, and the Constitution, and we're examining some of those cases. It's just really fun and interesting stuff and really lively discussions. But a lot of that constitutional law is not judicial decisions. It is executive practice. So I don't know if this is directly responsive to your question or not, But if the Constitution says that presidents can't start wars, but the president says that he can start wars and he said it a lot of times, you got to go with the Constitution and not with the faithless precedent uh, of the executive branch. If practice contradicts constitutional meaning, so much the worse for practice. Now, it's interesting in war powers. This this is really interesting. It's actually a a good illustration of originalism, too. Conservatives tend to be more pro-war and unilateral presidential executive assertions of power. It's a stereotype, but you know what I mean, right? And liberals tend to be more anti-war. Conservatives sometimes support presidential war-making on the ground that, well, we have a living constitution and this has happened before and so presidents can do this. They sort of completely contradict their constitutional premises. And nowhere do liberals seem more devoted to the text and original meaning of the constitution (laughs) than in war powers. Everybody changes their stripes, right? I am the one true, pure constitutional interpreter. <laughs> I don't change my stripes. If, you know, if, if the meaning of the Constitution contradicts my political inclinations, so then if I'm interpreting the Constitution, I have to say the Constitution means something different from my political inclinations. I don't like everything in the Constitution. I'm not a big gun guy. I don't like the Second Amendment, but Darn it, there it is, and that's what it says, and it means what it says, whether I like it or not. 
I've, as a former criminal prosecutor, I was always leery of the privilege against self-incrimination. I never thought that was a really very good constitutional privilege. But there it is in the Constitution. It means what it means, irrespective of my views. So I ramble. Sorry. Professors, you know, they do that. <laughs> Great question. Um, hello, my name is Trey Henry. I'm a political science and philosophy major here at Bethel, and I'm a sophomore. Um, this kind of pertains to the second myth. Um, and I, it's really a question of what would occur politically and civically if the president did in actuality, act as a dissenter to the court or legislator on matters of constitutional interpretation. Sorry. <laughs> constitutional interpretation? Yes. That is a fabulous question. Everybody in the legal academy and everybody in the law practice says that whatever a court decides, that binds the executive and the political branches. I can think of only one law professor in America who says that the president can refuse to comply with Supreme Court decisions that are wrong. And you're looking at him. I think that people fear the consequences of an independent presidential interpreter because they say, what would happen if you have a bad president? Well, I think that's a serious objection. I mentioned Lincoln. Lincoln refused to be bound by the Dred Scott decision. He rose to national prominence as a political candidate by saying that we oppose the Dred Scott decision, would seek to have it reversed. And when he was president, he defied an order by the Supreme Court's chief justice to produce a prisoner on a writ of habeas corpus. Okay? Lincoln is the one president who pretty clearly has defied judicial decrees. One might love it if you have a Lincoln and hate it if you have a Trump or hate it if you have a Biden or hate it if you have an Obama, right? Um, but I think that if the principle is right in principle, it is right in principle. And you follow the logic where it leads. What would happen if presidents actually did defy the Supreme Court? I think, it, I think it really would be upsetting and destabilizing, and that that's why people tend to default to the wrong view that whatever the Supreme Court says, we better make sure we just go with that, because we don't, we don't truly believe in the separation of powers and the independence of the branches. But, but I'm a true believer. What would happen if the legislator defied constitutional interpretation by the Supreme Court? Same thing. Same thing. Uh, this, the legislature... The Congress, during the Civil War, defied the Dred Scott decision. Dred Scott held that you can't prohibit slavery in the territories. Congress said, the heck with that, we're prohibiting slavery in the territories, and they enacted a ban that flew in the face of the Supreme Court's decision. Um, you would see more challenges to what the Supreme Court has done, but part of the separation of powers is that the Congress can defy the court, but the court can defy Congress. So Congress can't make the court decide a case a particular way because it thinks that's the better interpretation. It is a function of the separation of powers that each branch has sort of shootout nuclear weapons that it can use with which to thwart the will of the other branches. And Congress's shootout power is sort of the power of the purse and appropriations and sort of its political force and its legislative force. The president has the troops and the executive power. And the judiciary, as Alexander Hamilton said in the Federalist 78, is the least dangerous branch because it has neither force nor will but merely judgment. Ah, oh, and this is an interesting aside. And then he says, and must ultimately depend upon the executive, even for the efficacy of its own judgments. So Alexander Hamilton makes a passing reference to the notion that the president could refuse to honor Supreme Court decisions if the courts went really renegade. And actually, it's very, while I'm on Alexander Hamilton, should I start rapping? No. <laughs> oh, start wrapping up. Um, in Federalist number 81... 
Hamilton defends as a check against the abuse of judicial power the legislature's power to impeach justices for violating what Congress thinks is the proper understanding of the Constitution. So maybe that's the ultimate shootout power is the impeachment power could be used by Congress to punish or remove faithless interpreters. So you're right. You've got me. This is a scary proposition. When I give versions of this talk in in law circles or anything, people say, well, this would be terrible. Presidents would interpret the Constitution. What if they interpret it wrongly? There is that risk. But what if the Supreme Court interprets it wrongly and you've given them all the power and no check on it? Then then you, you have tyranny of a different sort. Maybe you prefer the tyranny of people wearing robes and writing legal briefs and everything like that to the tyranny of people who uh, hold guns and uh, issue insurrection or rally calls and stuff like that. There, there might be reasons to do that, but if you believe in the separation of powers, the last thing you want is to concentrate all power over everybody else in one branch. All right, so I'm going to ask one last question. One more. Oh, one more I question. thought I'd run out the clock, you, but it's been, not quite 8.30 yet. Very close. So one of the reasons perhaps there's so much controversial controversy over who is going to be the next Supreme Court justice or how a case is going to turn out, a case that is dealing with a really major question of, of constitutional interpretation. One of the reasons, of course, the stakes are really high, right, it takes a lot of time for a case to get to the court. Um, you know, it can take years even. The court is deciding on behalf of the whole country. But perhaps another reason why the stakes are so high is because the Constitution cannot be easily, easily changed. You don't have the same sort of, sort of constitutional, um, you don't have the same sort of stakes when it comes to the interpretation of state constitutions, for example, many of which can be amended very easily, at least in comparison to the United States Constitution. As you pointed out earlier, the U.S. Constitution is uh, extraordinarily difficult to amend um, and has been amended very few times compared to many other constitutions throughout the world. And so, uh, and that puts greater pressure um, on the Supreme Court in its interpretive role, perhaps, and also means there's a lot more political pressure on the court. Um, pressure that has only been increasing over the past several decades. And so my question to you is, should we have a constitution that is more easy to amend? Maybe we wouldn't want to go all the way with Thomas Jefferson, who said every generation should create its own constitution. Maybe that would be one extreme, but perhaps we are on the other extreme. Of a, There have been very few constitutional amendments in the past generation. Do you think what, what do you think about that idea? I, I talk about this with my theorist buddies, but um, it's always great to get uh, an attorney to to answer this sort of question. <clears throat> well, I don't Maybe call I, I call myself a recovering attorney. <laughs> <laughs> I make baby attorneys. You know, it might be a little bit. Worse. I think the Constitution should be easier to amend. I think Article 5 of the Constitution means what it means, and it makes it really, really difficult to amend the Constitution. And if I were listing some of the constitutional provisions that I'm not particularly fond of, I think I'd list Article 5 saying that that's way too cumbersome and difficult an amendment process. It permits one-fourth plus one of the state legislatures to veto a constitutional amendment that everybody else wants. And that would mean one house of what? what's one-fourth of uh, that, uh, 17, uh, 13. 13, uh, good, Whew, that, the pressure was on there. 13 states representing a very tiny minority of the population could thwart a highly popular constitutional amendment, I think that's too darn hard. But I don't misinterpret or reinterpret Article 5 to say, because I think this is not a good enough amendment process, 
I think that the amendment process should be interpreted to be the amendment process I would like it to be, right? It is, it is what it is. There are a number of things that change in the Constitution, if I, if I think about it. So, so what would the appropriate threshold be? So to even oh, begin, begin the discussion, right, you would need two-thirds, right? Um, and then ratification would require three-quarters. What about maybe a simple majority to get the discussion going and a two-thirds supermajority, perhaps, of state ratifying convictions or state legislatures ratifying? Like, what, what do you think would be more in a sort of more appropriate? Um, you know, I, I don't know. I, I, nobody's called me to a constitutional convention. <laughs> I, I haven't been a constitution drafter. Um, and I think then, I mean, I think a more valuable role than a, of, than a lawyer in that would be a political theorist who would say, oh, right, you. you know, uh, I am not, I think the framers were on to something with supermajority requirements and some preservation of stability, making it difficult to change. I think they went too far. How far is too far? Majority plus two thirds. I don't know. I'd have to ask a political scientist. Fair enough. Well, thank you so much for joining us. Let's uh, give him another round of applause. Thank you so much.